Good afternoon. My name is Maria Cordielos, and I am the executive director of the IGIS Institute. A welcome to the XML basics for NIBRS implementation. As uh, many of you who have gathered here today are aware of, the IGIS Institute is an organization that has been around for about 22 years, and it's uh, supported the public and private sector in many ways. For those of you that are new to the group, uh, we thought we'd spend a couple of minutes just reviewing a couple of slides, uh, reviewing the concepts of IGIS, its history and its purpose and goals, and then lead into what is the coursework for the XML um, training sessions. If you bear with me, I'm just going to show you a couple of slides. I'm going to go to share screens. So as I mentioned, we'll go through the IGIS Institute and chat about a little bit about its history and its goals and objectives. Uh, the Institute is a nonprofit collaboration network. And what that means is that the community that it serves is part of the community that is uh, part of its suite of services. Uh, it, it is made up of not only public sector practitioners on the federal, state, county, local level, uh, as well as the service providers uh, that support the mission space in order to maximize safety, efficiency, and productivity in the communities nationwide. How we do that with all those members at the table is by advocating for policies, processes, and information sharing standards. What that means is that from a federal perspective, state perspective, uh, often county and local perspective, there are many policies that work in harmony. There are, in fact, however, many policies that seem to compete with one another or sometimes contradict one another. In order to implement an effective information sharing standard program, uh, we, the IDIS community, become very fluent in what the policies are for the respective program and ensure that there is an alignment not only built into the solution set, but into the programmatic framework that then ensures success. We also need to understand the processes that are mandated at the federal, state, county, or local levels. Again, we're here to support the mission objectives of each of those agencies, uh, whether they come from any one of the criminal justice silos or any one of the civil justice silos or any one of the public domain entities that we service. From a technical perspective, uh, we are uh, tool agnostic. We have many different private sector uh, entities that are part of our membership, uh, but we all agree to move towards information sharing standards. And what that means is that we go towards a common bridge of understanding and sharing data elements that are imperative to in support the priorities of the operational entities. Given the 22 or 23 year history of the IDIS Institute, uh, we have developed over time, we have expanded over time, we have refined our mission over time. Uh, that has unfortunately and fortunately been driven by the world events uh, that we have witnessed, participated in, uh, been victims of, or uh, been uh, responders to from 9-11 to Katrina, uh, to Hurricane Sandy, uh, to January 6th, to the changing technology, to the school challenges and violence that happens all too often, and most recently, even the pandemic. As the world changes around us, so too does the need for data availability, uh, sometimes as quick as possible, but most importantly, as efficiently and as effectively as possible in order for decision makers at the federal, state, county, local levels to make wise choices. Those domain areas that the IDIS Institute started by supporting and continues and develops to uh, support over time, started with the traditional justice members of law enforcement, courts and corrections, and over time has expanded to fire, emergency management, emergency medical services, homeland security, uh, to reflect not only hometown, but homeland security, health and human services, school safety and critical infrastructure, to name only a few. The secret sauce as it relates to the IDIS Institute speaks to the public and private partnership that is part of that broader membership that I made reference to. Uh, from an organizational structure perspective, we have the IDIS Board of Directors that is represented by the private sector members uh, that are elected on an annual basis and soon to be a board of advisors that will represent the public sector entities 
of some of the domains that we service. The work and collaboration and partnership that happens on an ongoing basis is often witnessed at our advisory committee tables. Uh, we have the traditional law enforcement and criminal justice advisory committees that represent business done at the local and the federal levels. Uh, the courts and the corrections committees that speak to the broader communities. Uh, recently, and I say in terms of the pandemic, uh, we stood up what was an emergency communications and response advisory committee uh, that spoke to the changing time and dynamic uh, between the emergency communication centers, the old PSAPs or public safety answering points, uh, and how they have emerged to become more like real-time crime centers. And that may be, uh, that certainly represents a paradigm or a spectrum of progression over time in many different jurisdictions, uh, but it once again reflects how important data is to the responders at all levels. We also have an information technology advisory committee that speaks to the emerging, te the emerging technologies that are available to all of these public sector entities and domains. Again, as much as the tools and the technology is critical uh, to successful operations, uh, it should not be the be all end all. It must then support the policies and processes that I made reference to earlier. Finally, we've recently stood up what is a data analytics advisory committee. And that speaks to the slicing and dicing of data uh, that happens for so many purposes, uh, whether that is a national perspective to deal with Homeland Security issues, uh, be that national or international, uh, whether that is state or regional issues that then speak to fusion center issues that are dealt with on a regional basis, or whether that is a crime analytics that may happen for a particular jurisdiction uh, all of those uh, committees and all of those abilities to be able to utilize the data are then assessed and processes are built in order to facilitate those matters. I'll reiterate, uh, reiterate here uh, that the uh, individuals and volunteers at those tables, again, represent the totality of the IGIS community that is very, very broad uh, and comes from national and international players. It is the uh, public sector entities, it is the practitioners, it is the private sector members with the solution providers, or it is standard development organization, uh, researchers, statisticians, academics, and many, many more. Finally, by way of services and, and engagement opportunities at the IGIS Institute, uh, this event that speaks to the XML basics for NIBRA's implementation is just one example of how we try to ensure that the changing needs of the public sector domain are met, supported, and uh, success is ensured uh, by delivering different training and technical assistance opportunity, excuse me, technical assistance opportunities, program management services, uh, and or different events and webinars such as this. So know that as I stop sharing my screen for just a moment, uh, the critical uh, value of the training that will now be presented to you speaks to an effort that has been a long-standing partnership by, between many of the nonprofit organizations uh, and, most importantly, the federal sponsors that come from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, in support of the implementation of the NIBRS program. As many of you know and well understand from this domain, uh, the transition from summary reporting to incident-based reporting is one that has been going on for decades. Uh, I want to say the most recent generation was in 2013 with the uh, constitution of the NCSX program or the National Crime Statistics Program Exchange that then spoke to uh, focusing on 400 sample agencies that both FBI and BJS uh, supported the implementation in order to realize statistically relevant data uh, from national trend uh, creation and patterns to understand. Uh, that was then followed by many grants supported by those same agencies and more in order to implement uh, NIBRS on a national basis for the remaining of the 18,000 agencies. Um, RTI, Research Triangle International, uh, is a group that led what was a that NCSX program coupled with many of the partners that included the IDIS Institute, the search organization, 
uh, the IACP and PERF organization, as well as ACU, ASUCRP. With all that, you'll see that the Constitution of Players, even at that table, spoke to all of the process issues, the policy issues, the technical issues, the program issues, the training issues, et cetera. With that in mind, one of the last deliverables that is part of that NCSX program is the delivery of this XML basics for NIBRS implementation. Uh, though it is one that is critical to uh, agencies at local levels, uh, of course, your level of understanding from an agency perspective or from a service provider perspective uh, may be at the beginning of the spectrum, may be at the intermediate level, or may be at the advanced level. For that reason, we have three different levels that this uh, introduction will, will service to, to bridge for you. And we hope that each of the courses provides you great value to you and to your peers. Uh, know, too, that we are welcoming what will be questions over time. Uh, and with, with that we will uh, assemble and then produce what are FAQs that will be available at the IGES Institute website. Today we have Tom Carlson of Tom Carlson Consulting that will be delivering the curriculum for us. Uh, for those of you that have been part of the justice domain the last two or three decades, uh, you'll recognize the name, the skill set, and the accomplishments of this individual that has been part of the NEME or National Information Exchange Model Programs. He's been involved with several different organizations, be they at the federal, state, county, or local levels, and he has been instrumental in their success. He will be the uh, MC, he will be the curriculum development individual, uh, and he will be your moderator for the basic, the intermediate, and the advanced courses. We look forward to the questions that you have to ask of him. We ask that you uh, provide those questions through info at igis.com. And we once again, thank you for, for being part of this program. Take care and see you soon. We're going to cover more than just the basics. So that means we are going to delve into referencing. So most XML is strictly hierarchical. Uh, you, you just most XML you're going to see strict hierarchy. Uh, you got objects inside of objects inside of objects inside of objects. And you know, that's fine uh, most of the time. But real world stuff often has different kinds of connections between things. You've got different objects related to each other in different ways, and it's not just a straight hierarchy. And what a lot of people don't know is that XML schema allows for making connections between elements regardless of their location in the overall document. So typically you've got one item inside of another inside of another, um, but you can have one item somewhere in the XML tree make a direct reference to another item somewhere else, and that's perfectly fine. Perfectly normal to do an XML schema, just not something people do a whole lot. You've actually seen a little bit of this already when we were looking at the schemas we just looked at. Let's go quickly back up to the... Um, the name type example here, and you saw these references. Instead of hierarchically putting the definition of activity identification here, uh, we got a reference to it, and that reference points down to this name down here. Now, this form of referencing is specific to XML schema, but it does provide us with a more generic way of doing the same sorts of referencing. So let's take a look. <clears throat> Now, looking at our example, um, we see a bunch of things that get linked together. Let's look at it real quick here. Um, we see some linking going on, and we see it with this ID, and we see it uh, with a little reference somewhere, which is down all the way down to the bottom. We see references down here. Those are links that put things together. There's subject. There's a subject defined up here, uh, a victim another victim assigned up here and going up, and they can get linked together in different ways. Here's a link of this victim object is really, instead of having victim stuff inside of it, is pointing to victim number one, which is victim number one up here. So there are these kind of relationships linked together in the example document and in NIBRS. If you drew that particular example out, you'd look at, it look like this basically. There's one subject, two victims, both related to the subject, two offenses, one offense linked to one victim, the other offense linked to the other, and then a shared location for both of those offenses. They're all linked together like that in the example. 
Now to provide the actual linking, XML schema provides us with three different attributes that can go on to elements. One is called an ID, which is used to assign an ID to an element. One is called ID ref. The second one is ID ref, and that's a reference to an ID set on an element somewhere else. And the third one is ID refs plural, which is surprisingly difficult to say. Um, and that would have multiple, that would reference multiple IDs in the same attribute to point to more than one element. Now, to make these a little easier to use, we can make the names a little nicer. So we can add attributes uh, like this. So if we want to have an ID on something, we can add an attribute to it called ID of this ID type, and that will let us put IDs on those elements. So again, when we look at the example, this subject right here has this little attribute called ID, and this is its actual ID, subject one. Um, it could be anything, it could be any string, but we just use subject one, because it's clear that we, clear is what we're talking about. Another attribute, we do ref for the ID ref, um, so that now we can put an attribute on things called ref that is something that refers to these IDs up here. And we've got examples of that as well. So that's all these things down here, like this offense location association, which is just an object to link together an offense and a location. And the offense has got a reference to offense two. And if we scroll up far enough, we will find offense number two, which is right here. Here's a fence, here's the ID, a fence two. And that links them together. It says, hey, I'm a fence two. I think we were looking at, oh, I don't remember which one we were looking at. I think we were looking at this one though. Um, here's a fence number two. This is a reference to the one that's higher up in the document. We're not gonna put all the details here. Instead, we're gonna point to the one up there. And what's nice about that is that we can have two different things point to the same location. Here is offense location association. One copy of it that links offense one to location one. And then there's another one that links offense two to that same location one. Let's just share location one. So that's what referencing looks like. We can add those attributes anywhere we need um, to link things together. So here is a simplified version of how location type is set up. I've got a complex type. It's called location type. It's complex content. It's based on object type. Again, this is something out of Neem that you don't have to really worry about. It's just an empty, an empty object to start with. And it's going to add two things, a location address and a location category. But it also adds these two attributes, the ID and the ref. And now any object of location type, like location itself, um, can have either can have both of these attributes in it. So they can be assigned IDs or they can point to existing IDs for other objects. So that lets us say, hey, one location object has one ID, another location, or another, we don't have multiple location objects in this example, but we have the one location object with the ID location one, but we can have different things uh, point to it. And same thing with this offense. The offense is, is got the same attributes added and it can have its ID offense one. And then we can use the reference here to point to location one. There's a location, but instead of putting the location details here, it's a reference to the object with an ID that is location one, which is down here. And if this reference references an ID that doesn't exist in the document, you'll get an error. You'll get a validation error. So it does check that these are that these actually work. Note here in this XML that the stuff isn't linked, isn't isn't nested inside of each other. Um, this offense object is not nested inside of offense location association, nor is this location object. References to them are nested inside, but the actual objects aren't. They exist outside. And while in this example, they're all kind of next to each other, uh, in the simplified example, they don't have to be next to each other. We just saw that in the big example that you know, here is subject victim association and is pointing to victim number two, Victim number two isn't even on the screen. A little bit close, here they are. Um, some of these other ones as well, e, like the um, location is probably pretty far up. So here's location here, referring to location, but the actual object with the idea of location one is way up here. 
past the person. Oh, yeah, it's way up here. They're nowhere near each other. They're not in the same places in the hierarchy, but that's okay. You can link completely across the hierarchy. So it's very, very po um, powerful uh, to use. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that if, um, so in this case here, oops, I'm sorry, yeah, right here, like in this case here, you've got the location and it's empty. It doesn't have anything else inside of it. And if you look at the definition for location, um, actually in the schemas, it'll say, hey, these everything inside location is optional. And so it's okay to leave it empty because everything inside of it was optional. You'll find the same sort of thing with a fence. Everything in a fence is optional. Um, so it's okay to have an empty offense object because there isn't anything required to be inside of it. But what happens if things are required to be inside of it? Well, XML schema's got you there too, because it's got something called nil. And if you say nil equals true, then what that tells a validator is ignore that this is supposed to have required things inside of it. Um, instead, I'm saying it doesn't have any content, and I'm just going to use it as something like a reference. So that, that lets you make something be nil. So if, for example, the location object was required to have a zip code, then you wouldn't be able to normally do this, except for the nil equals true lets you do it. It lets you say, ignore the rules for what this is required to have inside. I'm just going to say it's nil, it's empty, it doesn't have any content, and then I can use it as a reference and just have it be empty. Um, it's not a bad practice to always put the nil here. Um, people can get sloppy though. Um, this example is sloppy. Most of the things I do are sloppy, um, where they don't do the nil here because the things inside were optional anyways, and they didn't have to. Uh, it, it's good practice to put it there though when you're doing something that could have content, but in the case you're using it just as a reference. So just something to keep in mind. So why do we use this referencing? Well, uh, there's a number of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is um, it can avoid replication of information. So again, in our big example here, we've got two different things referring to the location. If we go back down, um, actually if I just look at the, the diagram I drew earlier, Look at the diagram early, instead of following the IDs and refs. This is what the, this diagram does. Um, you've got one location for both offenses. So if you're not going to use referencing, you're going to have like location in well, location inside of each offense. And that means you're going to have the location listed there twice. And is that a problem? Well, if location is a small object, then no, it probably isn't. Um, but if location is a large object, and a lot of things in XML can get really big, you can do things like, um, that'd be actually a really a better example is talking about the two victims um, and the one subject. You know, instead of having one subject with two, with two victims, you could have the subject twice. Um, but, you know, I've seen exchanges that allow things like images to be, converted into text. It's called base64. It's a way of, of representing binary files in text, um, but converted to base64 and put it right in the exchange. And it, it, they're huge. Uh, so if you had the subject in there twice with a mugshot in there twice, that's really almost doubling the bandwidth required for that exchange. So it prevents you or it, it makes it so that you can avoid replicating information. You can have the, a piece of information there once and then just have the things that refer to it have links to it. Number two is it establishes equivalency. Um, and the example I like to use for this is is my cat, um, actually our cats, and me. Um, so, you, you know, I, we've got, I have two cats. One cat is named Jet and one cat is named Knuckles. So Jet and Knuckles each have an owner, and that owner has a name. Jet's owner's name is Tom Carlson. That, that's my name. Uh, Jet's owner's name is Tom Carlson. Knuckles' owner's name is Tom Carlson. They both have an owner named Tom Carlson. Now, given that, is it the same person? Do they have the same owner? Well, just given that, you don't really know. Um, 
I used to live in Virginia. I, I grew up in Minnesota. I moved to Virginia for nearly three decades, and then I moved back to Minnesota. Um, while I lived in Virginia, I found that Tom Carlson, and in fact Carlson is the last name, is not a common name. Um, there, there aren't really any Tom Carlson's in Virginia. There's a couple, like five total, something like that. So if you run across two cats and they both have an in Virginia and they both have an owner named Tom Carlson, it's pretty probable that that's the same person. Very, very probable. But Minnesota is a different deal entirely. In Minnesota, Tom Carlson is an incredibly common name which plagued me throughout my childhood. Um, when I played Little League Baseball, there were two Tom Carlsons on the team. Okay, so this is like a dozen kids. You grab a dozen random kids and two of them are named Tom Carlson. Um, and unfortunately, the other Tom Carlson was better than me. So my glove, I had to write Tom Carlson number two on my glove uh, to indicate it as being me. So if you're in Minnesota, which I now am, and both these cats are, and you find these two cats and they both have an owner named Tom Carlson, you know, you better not be relying on that being the same person because you really don't know. There's a lot of Tom Carlson's around here and a bunch of them probably have cats. You know, some of them probably share my birth date. Um, there's an algorithm that says if you have a room with so many people in it, chances are greater than 50% that two of them will share a birth date. Um, there's hundreds of Tom Carlson's in Minnesota. It's almost guaranteed that at least one of them shares a birth date with me. So referencing can establish equivalency to show that these two objects, um, the, the two objects that relate to a third object, that third object is the same for the other two objects. The owner of these two cats is me, not potentially two people with the same name as me. And so it establishes that equivalency. And then finally, it allows for non-hierarchical linking of objects, which often represents real life a lot better um, than hierarchies do. That's how real the real world works. You know, as part of my move from Minnesota, we're trying to sell the house, right? We're selling the house in Virginia. Well, the relationship of me and my wife and the house and the bank and the mortgage is not a hierarchical relationship. Um, you know, we are not part of the house. The house is not part of us. The mortgage is not part of us. And it's really not part of the house. The mortgage is an agreement between us and the bank regarding the house. Real world relationships are very, very different. Um, they're not usually hierarchical like XML. And while usually you can get by with the hierarchical, sometimes it's really nice to be able to link objects together in a more natural way. Um, and Neem, which Nibers is based on, tries to provide that ability, and indeed Nibers uses it to do this kind of linking that we saw in the diagram up here. One subject related to two victims, each related to their, their own offense, um, and then both those offenses related to a, a common location. We can establish it's a common location, not just two locations with like the same address. It's the same location. It's also the same subject. And so we get a lot of power from the referencing. Fairly advanced XML schema that you don't see used a lot, but it's used in Nibers uh, for these very reasons that we've talked about here. And now we get to namespaces. And namespaces are a way to organize elements into different contexts. Um, consider a word like case. Words on their own don't always have a lot of meaning. What about the word case? Well, what the word case means is highly dependent on the context that you're seeing the word case in. Um, if you're talking about courts, it's a court case, you know, that you brought into a court of law and you sued somebody. If you're in the area of social work, it's a social work case. It's, it's a collection of information about somebody who's come in to get social work help. Um, if you're in the medical field, a case might be a case of the flu. Um, it's, it's, it's something you catch. If you're in detective fiction, um, then a case is something Sherlock Holmes solves, like the case of the speckled band. And if you're talking about containers, then you might be talking about, you know, like a briefcase. You might be talking about a, a case of, of beer, perhaps, or a case of, of pop. I live in Minnesota now, so it's pop, not soda. Um, a case of pop. And what you mean by the word case is highly dependent on which of these contexts you are in. So what namespaces do 
is it allows us to provide context for elements. You can have the same element name in a different context by putting a namespace on the front. An XML schema supports namespaces by allowing you to declare these different contexts um, defined by separate XML schema documents, and each one is given a nickname to add to the front of elements to identify the context the element is in. So in NIBURST, there's a variety of different contexts depending on where that element's name came from. So there are elements in, in, in the exchange that are NIBURST specific, NIBURST specific content, and they will have a nickname, a prefix for the elements that reflect that. There are some elements that come out of the FBI CJIS standard. There are some elements that are code tables that are related to CJIS, so they're CJIS code tables. There are other FBI, non-CGIS, but still FBI code tables that are used in NIBRS. And then there's content from the National Information Exchange Model from NEEM. Some of it is generic content, and some of it is just as specific content. And then finally, there are elements that use data types that are provided by XML schema itself. And namespaces provide us a means of knowing which of these different contexts are the context that this element is from. It helps identify, it, it identifies the context. So that when I see an element, I can see whether that element is in this context or just you know other FBI code tables or some generic content out of Neem or it's just as content out of Neem. I can tell that because each element is going to be identified with a prefix that represents that context. And then each of these contexts has a name, has a globally unique name to let us know here is the context. And all of this starts as attributes to the root element of the schema document. So when you first saw the schema document, remember I kind of glossed over the attributes. I said I'd explain them later. Now I'm explaining them later. Oops, and let me get over just to show you the full thing in its glory. Here's the start of the schema, and there's all these different attributes, and these attributes are all about um, defining different namespaces, different contexts for things. So back to the materials, uh, just slightly simplified here to really carve it down to the important context, but each one of these matches one of the ones above. So NIBR specific content, that's in a namespace called FBI.gov CGIS NIBR 2019. That's a name for this namespace. Now I know it looks like a URL. It's actually not. It's a URI. It's a universal resource identifier. A uh, URL is a universal resource location. So a URL leads somewhere. A URI doesn't necessarily have to lead somewhere. Although it, oftentimes it does and it's kind of um it's nice if if your um if your names of your namespaces do actually go to a web page somewhere with information. That's nice when that happens, but it doesn't actually have to. But they look like URLs. There are other forms for these as well, um, but Nibris and Neem both use these URL formats for it. So this first one here, this is declaring context for Nibris specific content. This is the name of it. It's its full name. Um, this is a nickname, just this part is the nickname we're going to use. And this attribute name says we're, we're, de we're declaring a namespace here. So we're declaring a namespace. It's called Nibers. That's the nickname we're going to use. And this is the full name. It's just like humans. You know, my full name is, is Thomas Charles Carlson. Sets me apart from all the other Tom Carlsons, except for the probably dozens of Thomas Charles Carlsons in Minnesota. Um, but, you know, if somebody wants me, they just say Tom. Um, they, they don't have to say my full name. They just use my nickname. Actually, Tommy, usually. But So this is a nickname. This is the Thomas Charles Carlson. This is, this is Tom, or Tommy, if you know me well. The second context, FBI CGIS standard, it's declared here. It's got a nickname called CGIS, and then here is the URI, the full name for that namespace, for that context. Then uh, related CGIS code tables, that gets a nickname called CGIS Codes, and its full name is fbi.gov CGIS slash CGIS dash codes dot two dot zero. Um, other FBI code tables, that's in the UCR namespace, and here's the, the full name for that. 
Um, the H I haven't been saying the HTTP colon slash slash, but that's part of it. So its name really is HTTP colon slash slash release.neem.gov slash neem slash code slash FBI underscore UCR slash 3.2 slash, but its mom just calls it UCR. And then you've got generic neem content. That's NC for neem core. And here's its full name. J is for justice content. And that's its full name. And then this is the data types from XML schema. And that's the full name for that. So each of these things has a little prefix, but the prefixes are all linked to these full names. So up until now, we've kind of glossed through the prefixes, but now we can understand what they all mean. We can go to our an example here and we can start to see these things. We see, oh, here's a person it's an NC colon person. That means it's from Neem Core. That tells us the context. It's from Neem Core. It's from the part of Neem that is kind of generic things, not um, specific to a particular domain. Here's a victim. It's got a J colon on the front. It's from the justice domain inside of Neem. It's, it's Neem elements, but they're from the justice domain. If we go way to the top, you'll see a lot of this comes straight out of Neem, but some of it, you know, some of it comes from other contexts. So the submission itself is Nibers. It's a Nibers context. It's defined by Nibers in the schema just for that. Um, but the message metadata is from uh, the CGIS namespace. It's CGIS content. And there's a separate schema that defines this stuff. Um, get down a little further, um, a lot of CGIS stuff. And then, but CGIS uses the CGIS uh, message submitting organization, uses the J organization augmentation, which has a J organization or a identification inside of it. And that has an identification ID inside of it. But notice how we're using different contexts here. This one is CGIS, but it contains something from justice, which contains something from justice, which then contains something from meme core, uh, generic meme stuff. Get a little further, got Nibers, it's got a report from the Nibers context, report header from the Nibers context, a lot of Nibers specific things. So as we go through, we see the different prefixes and the prefixes tell us the context things come from. So you could have, you could have like an item, Neem core item, and you could have a J colon item, a justice item, and you could have a CGIS item if CGIS had its own idea of what constitutes an item, and you would know the difference because of the prefix. You could tell whether this is a Neem core item or a justice item or a CGIS item or a Nibers item by looking at the namespace prefix, which is linked to the actual, um, to the URI, to the full name. Now I've been talking about how each of these are represented by a schema. And so then the next question is, well, how does, how does a validator find the schema? Well, each of these namespaces, these declarations come along with an import statement that tells a validator, here is the file that defines the rules, the context for this particular namespace. So if I see something with an NC on the front and I wanna find out you know, what the rules are for that. And this is actually what a validator will do. It'll go, oh, I want to find out what a Neem core person, an NC colon person is supposed to have. Well, it looks up here and says the Neem core prefix. Oh, this is the full name. Then it looks through the import statements and it finds, oh, there's a the full name that matches it. And then it looks at the schema location and goes, oh, well, look at that. That's where the schema is. And it reads in that schema and that's how it finds out what the rules are uh, for an NC colon person. So that's what the prefixes give you. They give you that way to categorize these things into different contexts, each context represented by a different schema document. Now it's really, really, really important, I can't underscore how important it is to declare and use namespaces correctly. It's just as important to do that correctly as to have the tag names correct themselves. Okay, so if I go and I look here and, you know, here is a J offense and I'm going to go into edit mode just to, to play with the XML there. Um, and if I made this offense, offense W, I put a W on the end, that's going to cause a validation error because offense, what, offense, offense is not one of the elements that's defined as being in this place. And this is somewhere inside the report. It's not, report isn't defined to hold an offense, it's defined to hold an offense. 
but it's just as important that this prefix be right. Because um, if this prefix is JW, you're going to have the same problem. A validator is not going to know where to look to find what makes a JW offense, and it won't be listed as one of the things that can be inside a report. So both sides of this are important. And um, you know, people sometimes have problems getting the namespace side right because they don't understand that that's just as important. It's just as important that this prefix be right as the rest of the element name be right. If either one is wrong, it's wrong, and a validator won't be able to make sense out of it, and you won't be able to parse it, and the, the, pers the entity who receives it won't be able to parse it and make sense out of it, because both sides have to be right. Also, just as important, this stuff up here has to be right as well. This has to be right. Got to have the right string there, and the import for it, if you're doing the schema, has to be right. If this isn't right, then a validator, even if I'm using the right prefix, this is just a nickname. If I don't get the name right, I don't get the name right. The nickname isn't enough. Um, so if you try to look me up and you go, hey, Tommy, um, but then, you know, the validator thinks my full name is Thomas Clarence Carlson, um, which is my brother's middle name. Um, his name isn't Tom, but it thinks I'm Thomas Clarence Carlson. You're going to get the wrong Tom Carlson. This has to be right, too. Um, so it's really important to stress that, you know, these things aren't made up. Uh, these things mean something, and they got to be right, including the trailing slash. So this has got to be right. This has got to be right. And wherever you use it, we get back down to one of the J's, just JFNs, needs to be right here too. It's really, really important those all be right. If they're not right, then it won't validate correctly. And if you send stuff with the namespaces done wrong, the thing that, that accepts it and tries to consume it will choke on it because the tag names aren't right. It's just as important that the namespaces be, in right, be correct. And when in doubt, you go look at valid Nivers examples. Nivers is happy to provide examples. Here's one. This has got it all right. So you copy and paste this um, into your development environment, you'll get it right. But it's really important um, because people don't think about namespaces that much. Sometimes they don't spend as much time getting them correct. And that's a problem. They need to be correct. Let's move on to some ways to restrict data. So we've been talking a lot about, you know, you've got strings and you've got some numbers and things like that. Um, and I said earlier that you can constrict those to make them kind of special, uh, to make it so that it's not just an arbitrary string. So let's look at some of the ways to do that. The first and the most commonly used here is enumerations. Uh, these are code tables. This is a way to make code tables that, um, constrain the value of a string. And it's used extensively in Nibers. Again, if you look at the example and all the ones that are code tables, I'll end with the word code. So I think I can just go and do a find for it. Um, and as we get down, you'll start to, as I get, I get past the attributes, uh, it's not picking them up. Oh, there they are. Okay. It just didn't scroll automatically. You know, here's a category code. Here's another category code. Um, there's more. If we go down further. There's another code, here's another code, here's another code, here's another code. Some of these are generic out of Neem. Um, some of them are very specific to Nibers. Some of them are going to come out of Siege, the Sieges code tables. Um, there's just, you see, they're outlined here. There's just tons of codes, tons and tons of codes in Nibers. Uh, code tables are great because code tables constrain the values that you can send. You can't just send an arbitrary string. You can only send one of these, you know, five strings are the only ones that are valid. And what's nice about XML schema is if you define a code table in it, it will check to make sure the data you sent is one of the allowable codes. It'll do that for you. So here's just really quick is the sex code table. Um, this is out of the NC IC um, uh, domain in Neem. This is not, I don't, I don't think this is part of, of Nibers, but this is just a nice handy code table that, that is short so I can show it to you in its full glory. You have a type, it's a simple type. Now Neem does some fancy things with this, but you don't to understand how this works, all you really need to know is it's a simple type. It's um, a restriction of something called token. Now, what is a token? A token is just a string with the white space stripped off the beginning and end. 
because XML allows you to be pretty free with how you format things. Um, so I can do things like, I'm going to go back into edit mode here just to show you. Here's a person age measure, um, measure integer value. The value here is 32. That's nice and clean, right? What is, what's the value of measure integer value? It's whatever's between the two tags. It's a three and a two, right? It's very simple. Um, but XML will let you do this. Um, and that's perfectly fine, but technically now the value in there is a carriage return, about six tabs, a 32, a carriage return, and five more tabs. That's, that's literally the string between those two tags. Now, usually, you know, XML schema or XML will handle that, development environments will handle it, but when you're really doing matching against text strings. It's nice to really make sure that you just get the three and the two. And that's what token does. Token knocks that back down to the three and the two. Uh, so, whoops, whenever I go too high, my menu bar comes back. So what we've got here is a type, a simple type, it's called sex code. Um, it's a restriction. We've seen extensions a few times now to take something, make it special by adding things to it. This is the opposite. This is taking something and making it more special by restricting what it can be. So it says, hey, we're going to strict, restrict down this token, which is just a string without white space on the ends. And we're going to have three different enumerations, different values it can be. The first is the value F, capital F. Uh, it's case sensitive unless you're developing. Yeah, no, it's case sensitive. Uh, XML and XML schema are case sensitive. So you can have an uppercase F as your code for the sex. Second enumeration, an uppercase M. Uh, third enumeration, an uppercase U for unknown. So um, you've got these three choices. So then you have an element down here, person sex code, of this sex code type. And now any element that's any person sex code element, it can contain only these three values, an F, an M, or, oops, I can't really highlight it well, or a U. And what these mean are in the documentation. So the F means female, the M means male, and the U means unknown for unidentified only. Um, so the FBI um, and CIC doesn't let you have, doesn't let you have um, other sexes. It's just maybe may male, female, or unknown. There are other code tables in Neem that have adult additional things, you know, X's and T's and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but NCIC, nope. M, F, or U for unknown. Um, so those are the only choices. So if then you find this element, those are the only three values that can be there. And a validator will check if you send through a person sex code of, um, you know, whatever, double, no, duh, eh, well, let's just say A, uh, person sex code of A, um, it'll say, hey, that doesn't match. It has to be an F and M or a U. So then what you end up getting is something like, here's a person with the person sex code. We put M, everything's fine. A validator will be happy with that. That will pass the code test, the code table test. But this example of X would fail because X is not one of the enumerated values in the code table we just looked at up here. It's not one of the values. And so we can constrain our data types with code tables. It's very, very common. Uh, we just looked, the example uses several. Um, I can go to the, my XML editor, and in addition to the NIB, main NIBR schema, there's a separate namespace. Remember, there's a NIBRS code namespace. See, it's, um, it's defined right here, and here is its full name, and it gets imported right here, and the schema is called NIBRS codes XSD, and here's the file right here, and this is where all the NIBRS codes are defined. And you can see that you've got, you know, the, the type is a restriction of token. It's a restriction of token, and it's got different enumerations. So this is an offense code um, from the Uniform Crime Reporting, UCR, and there's 09A. A, that means murder and non-negligent manslaughter. 09B means negligent manslaughter. 09C means justifiable homicide. And, you know, if you use a code that isn't, it's a pretty long code table, but if you try to use a code for the offense that is not one of these codes, it's going to raise a validation error. Um, so, you know, you better check that before you send it because it won't work when it gets there um, to the other end because it's not one of the allowable codes. So that's how code tables work. Um, and it's a very good way to constrain strings down to just a set of 
specific strings that are allowable. Um, and some of the, you get all sorts of them. Um, Nyverse is full of them. Neem, on which Nyverse is based, has probably thousands of them. Um, just tons of code tables. But you're used to code tables, even at work, but even at home, right? You get mail, you got a state code. Mine's changed from VA for Virginia to MN for Minnesota. And, you know, Neem has a uh, state code table with all those codes in it so that you can check and make sure somebody isn't sending a fake two-letter state code. So that's one way of um, constraining the values of something. Another way is through patterns. Um, I don't think you see any patterns in Nibers, um, but I just want you to know about them uh, so that, you know, because they're part of XML schema and they're part of how it works. You can also do things um, that define what a string can be by like by using a pattern. It's basically a regular expression if you're familiar with those. Here's just a really simple example. If we want to have a type for zip codes and we want it to be, you know, the five digits and a dash and the four digits, instead of making a code table with every combination, which would be a very, very long code table, um, instead we're just going to define the pattern for it. And this is the regular expression for the pattern. You can have a digit from 0 to 9, followed by a second one, followed by a third, followed by a fourth, followed by a fifth, followed by a dash, followed by another four digits, 0 to 9 each of them. So this is a way to define the format for the zip codes. If I try to send in something that is not five numbers and a dash and four more numbers, I would get a validation error because it wouldn't be fitting the pattern for a zip code. You could do the same thing for, you know, like an email address. I have an email address type, anything like that, anything that's a, that's a pattern. Um, you can write a pattern in XML schema to test for it to make sure things fit the pattern. Although keep in mind, this pattern requires the dash and four digits at the end. So you might want to have a separate zip code type for just, you know, the five digits. I still don't remember, you know, my dash four digits. Anywhere I've lived, I've never remembered uh, the four digit extension. I always have to look it up. You can also have numerical ranges. So for example, um, maybe I have an element for a person age and it's an integer and I can give it minimum and maximums for the value. So you can't have an age less than zero. And I'm just going to say, yeah, you can't have an age greater than 120. And then somebody who's 121 will very slowly raise their hand. And I'll say, okay, we'll make it 130. Um, but, you know, there is a maximum value for how old a person can get, for how, how large their age can be. And you can constrain that here. Um, again, you'll see it um, with things like latitude and longitude in Neem, which Nibris is based on, and those will be limited to like 0, 1, 8, or minus 180 to 180 degrees uh, for, I, I believe, the latitude, or is it the longitude? I can never get them straight, um, and the other one's like three, 0 to 360. So you can do that with numbers as well. And then the last way of, um, last way of constraining um, the common way of constraining is to constrain strings by length. So you can do that as well. You can say, hey, here is a, an element. It's a password. It's a string. But it has to be, of course, a minimum of eight characters and no more than 16 characters. You can do that kind of thing for strings as well. Um, again, Nyverse, Nyverse doesn't do any of these really except for the code tables. Nyverse uses code tables heavily, but Nyverse doesn't use patterns, ranges, or string lengths because Neem uses a few patterns, but otherwise doesn't use them either, and Nibris is based on Neem. But you should know what they are. Um, if you want to know more about all the different types of data types and how they get constrained in different ways, XML schema itself is defined in XML schema. And you can go download it. It um, looks like this, and it's got all the different data types in it. Um, that, that, that is supported automatically in XML schema. I'm not going to go through it because you don't really need to know it, but if you're, um, if you're curious and you want to see data types and you want to see how they're put together and all of that, you can go and look at this. You can go download it off the internet. Just search for XML, sch XML schema for XML schema or something similar and you'll get to it. So we're going to get to another topic. It's kind of a change of gears, although it does feed into a little bit into the code tables we talked about, and that is substitution groups. So the idea with substitution groups, and again, this is um, plain old valid XML schema, but it's XML schema you don't see very often. 
But the idea here is that sometimes you have concepts that can be represented in multiple ways. Um, a real simple example is the difference in writing dates between U.S. and Europe. You know, in U.S., we write the month followed by the day and then the year. And in Europe, um, I think Canada too. Um, but, you know, it's like Canada's like, you know, European U.S. sort of, you know, it's weird. Um, but, you know, Europe goes um, the day followed by the month and the year. Um, I've mentioned earlier, they're both wrong. Um, they should use ISO format, which is year, 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 dash month, month, dash day, day. I feel strongly that this is the best date format. And incidentally, it is the one that's built into XML schema. If you want a different date format, you got to add it yourself. Um, but this is the one that's in there. But, you know, what if you want to support all these different ones? You you could either have uh, a bunch of different date objects, or you could have one object representing the concept of a date, and then have it be replaced by different specific implementations of a date format. Um, and another version is code tables, and that's what I'm going to talk about in more detail here. Um, when you've got code tables, you might want to have the option to have just a full text description as well. Um, for example, I like to use like a uh, eye color, right? There's an eye color table in Neem. I don't think Nibris uses it, but there's an eye color table in there and it's got a value of BLU for blue. Well, what if that's, I have blue eyes. What if that's not enough? What if what I want is faded pale blue, like your favorite pair of old jeans? Cause that's, that's actually the color blue of my eyes. It's, it's pale blue jean color. Um, you can't represent that in a code. Um, so maybe you want to be able to have both a code and a string version um, as well. So one example, and this is this is directly out of out of Neem. Um, and again, it's not used in Nibris, I don't think, but it's it's a really good example because everybody's familiar with person sex, is the concept of person sex. And you can represent that as a code from a code table. What code table? The one we just looked at when we looked at code tables, or you could represent it as a string if you needed to. So the way this is done is that you have something called a head, a substitution group head, and that's this element here. It's got a name, just person sex, but it doesn't have a type attached to it. Instead, it says abstract equals true. And what this means is that this doesn't have a type. It's just a placeholder. It can't appear in the actual XML document. It just takes the place. It just holds the place for something else that will replace it that is a more specific form of the concept of a person's sex. What can replace it? Well, two different things in this example. One is this person's sex code. So you got a person sex code of sex code type that comes from the code table. That's the example we looked at for code tables. That's the M, F, and U. Um, so that's one element. Another element is person sex text, which is of Neem's text type, which is just a string. Um, so here's a code table that could be M, F, or U. And here is a string that can be any arbitrary string. And we know that they can replace person sex because they tell us they can. They say, hey, I'm a member of a group of things that can substitute for something, and the thing I can substitute for is this person sex. Same thing down here. I am a member of a group of things that can substitute for person sex. And so anywhere where there could be a person sex object, it could be, it would, it would need to be replaced by either the code version or the text version by either one of those. Um, and that's the gist of substitution groups. And so the resulting XML could be something like, here's a person with the person sex code of M, has to be M, F, or U, or it could be a person sex text with a string male, um, or could be manly man, that would work as well, because uh, it's an arbitrary string. So this one's better for data, you know, basic data, data, um, sanitation, making sure the data is right. Um, this one is more flexible for times where you need to be more flexible. And you can have either one be an option as a replacement for person sex. Um, and there are examples of this in here. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember the, the one offhand. I should have had a link to it. I should make sure I don't actually have a link to it. Nope, I don't. Okay. Um, but there are some... There are some, I think, Siegis things that come in. Oh, we do have the person sex code here. So it is used here um, inside a person. 
And if you look at the schema for person, you'll see it, it has a person sex inside, but then that gets replaced by person sex code. Um, but the, I wanted to make a point, if I can find it. Yeah, some of these here are done with substitution groups. So there is a, there's a, a substitution group head inside this association that then we can replace with this NIBRS victim subject relationship code. And the key to substitution groups, and why you see them in NIBRS and in NIEM that NIBRS is based on, is because it allows for distributed governance of things. So that you can have one body saying this is a subject victim association, but allowing another body to put things into this object via substitution groups without actually changing this object. So that's maybe kind of esoteric to think about. Um, but there are some advantages to using substitution groups, and one of them is the ability to more widely distribute governance of a large, a large number of schemas like NIEM um, and, by extension, uh, NIBRS. Now, we talked a little bit about um, uh, compositors. Up, up, up a bit ago in XML schema. And we talked about how there's sequence, but there's also choice. Uh, choice is an option for things like this as well. If I wanted to have a choice of a person's sex code or a person's sex text, I could do it like this. I could just say person sex type. You have a choice, either this element or this other element. Um, the problem here is that if you want to add a third option, you have to redefine this. And in terms of governance, you got to go then talk to whoever controls this. Whereas if you do it via substitution groups here, if I want to add a third option, option one, option two, I can add a third option, a third kind of element with its own code table and just give it the same substitution group without having to go to the people who govern this element to get them to change the definition. Um, so that's why you see substitution groups used. Um, you're not going to see it widespread in XML in general, um, but it's a very powerful tool, especially when you're dealing with large data models um, like NIEM that under, underlies NIBRS. Uh, very, very important then. A few more topics before we get to the end. Well, there's one more topic, a very small topic. You've seen this uh, here and there throughout, but these are annotations. Um, pretty much anything in XML schema can have an annotation to it. And the annotation then holds a documentation tag, and that contains basically the definition of the thing you're talking about. So in this case, here is an element called report. It's of NIBRS report type. And what is it? It's a report being submitted to the National Incident-Based Reporting NIBRS program. This is not my typo. This is their typo. Um, so that's actually a typo in the schema itself. But we all we all know it's not tot he. We all know it's to the. So we're not gonna we're not gonna knock them for that. Um, the annotation element can go pretty much anywhere. Um, you've seen it in all over. You saw it in the code tables. Um, let me just go, yeah, let's go up. Uh, you know, here's the annotations here for this element. You've got annotations in the code tables as well. That's how you know what the codes mean because of the annotations, plus an annotation for the, the code table type itself and an annotation uh, for the element of that type. So you find annotations all over the place in XML schema. And the point is to provide a machine readable way to explain what different things are. Um, it doesn't figure into the validation at all. This could be, this could say just about anything, but it's valuable for tools to be able to use to automatically extract documentation about different elements um, so that it can tell you what the different elements mean. It's a very, very handy thing. Um, and that's really the last topic. Just in conclusion, um, you should now have a, a decently solid overview of XML and XML schema. Honestly, you don't really understand these things until you start to use them. Um, and the XML part of it should get you most of the way towards being able to replicate um, required required exchanges for NIBRS, but the XML schema is there to help you understand why certain things work the way they do and to have a better understanding of, um, of how things fit together and how they work. So the combination of the two should allow you to start to define and create XML documents with information to be exchanged 
Um, in this case, a NIBR submission, but you know, any sort of information exchange. This is a general purpose XML and XML schema knowledge. But it's important to know that it's not the end. XML and XML schema are not the end all and be all. There's other business rules in any exchange. There are al always plenty of business rules in any exchange that can't be reflected in XML schema. Um, those rules could be additional constraints for the XML or could be wider business rules that impact how exchanges are being implemented. Nibers, for example, has some additional things to pay attention to. For example, don't upload multiple instances in a single XML file. One incident per XML file. Um, the schema validation will try to enforce that. But again, don't, don't do it. Uh, crime reporting via XML is transaction-based. Only one incident and arrest can be reported in a single file. Each file, you need to transmit it individually. So some of this, you know, you can, you can get into the don't do multiple incidents in a single XML document, but sometimes people will glom a bunch together into a file. Um, these are rules that are kind of outside the XML. There's a lot of importance about the action types. Don't modify an incident by deleting it and then re-adding it. Don't send a D and then, a, then an I. Those are the different codes. And, and there's a code table for these, right, in the schemas that define them. But, you know, don't delete it and then re-add it. Instead, do a replacement. You know, just send, send an R one. Um, that minimizes the load on the end server. That could be a big deal for big states uh, like California. Um, Rhode Island, probably not a problem. But for big states like California, um, doubling the workload by deleting and then reinserting or, or re, um, re-adding it with an I, um, and that's, that's twice the load of just sending an R. The R is there for a reason. Use it. Um, but again, this is an XML schema. The XML schema has got a code table for these codes, but the XML schema doesn't tell you this kind of business rules that's one level removed. Um, another one, set of dumping data list simultaneously. Uh, it's preferred to send incidents sequentially from your system to the repository. Don't send them all um, at once. Uh, send one at a time. This supports the sequential approach used when extracting data um, from the repository. So again, this isn't an XML rule. There's nothing in XML schema to say, hey, don't send a bunch of these simultaneously. Send them one at a time. Um, you, you, that's not XML schema, but it's still important. These are business rules that exist outside of what XML schema can do. Uh, the last one, as a good practice, send only the latest version of incidents. Don't upload multiple versions of an incident at the same time. I, uh, for example, an I and a D and an I and a D and an I and a D and an I all at the same time. Instead, use the I for just the latest version, or if there's already a prior version there, use an R to replace that prior version. Again, don't delete it and then do an I. Again, none of this, these are all separate XML documents. All the schema has is the definition of the code table that says, hey, you know, this code can be a D or an I or an R, um, things like that. It doesn't control these larger business rules. And yet, if you don't follow these business rules, Things don't work well. It's, it's really important. So, you know, we've given you this XML Basics training um, in the hope that it's useful for you to be able to uh, implement Niverse exchanges and do the submissions. But there are still um, business rules and things you have to look out for that aren't in the XML. And you know, no amount of XML training is going to and tell you or, or make you follow these other rules. But, you know, these are rules Nivers puts out there and says, hey, this is how you need to do it. So for information exchange to work, it's more than just the XML and the XML schema. There's also policy things, uh, things you have to implement um, that go beyond that. So I don't want you to think that this training is all you need to know uh, to successfully to successfully do NIVR submissions. There's a lot more to it. Um, and these are just some of the things. And there's other documentation out there to help know what those rules are. But hopefully now you've got an idea about XML and XML schema, and that gives you a good starting point to continue to be able to work with, um, with NIVR submissions. Thanks, and I hope you enjoyed it.